Good morning. Good morning. Christmas morning to worship you. 
God, we just pray today that everything we say, everything we do, would just bring honor and worth to your most precious and holy name. It's a great privilege to be able to gather this morning to celebrate Jesus' birth and um, the incarnation and what that actually means to us and, and means to our lives. And um, it helps us to remember um, the great sacrifice you laid down for us. So as we worship you this day, we pray everything would bring honor to your name. Pray these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat. Let's turn to page 141. Uh, we're going to sing together, O Little Town of yeah. Bethlehem. <laughs>
This morning, got here, but we got up and it's not been so just want to wish everybody a uh, Merry Christmas and continue to remember RC as well. Okay, any others? All right, let's pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, uh, you are a great God, and it's a great privilege to be able to gather together with your corporate body here this morning, to be able to gather together on this Christmas day and to um, worship you. Uh, Father, we're so thankful that at the very beginning, when we develop this sin problem, um, this wanting to do things our own way, we, that we almost know better. Um, as we start to rebel against you, that you loved us so much that you wouldn't leave us in this condition, but you sent your son. And as we gather here this morning, we gather in this place to um, celebrate um, that coming into this world, the incarnation, um, um, that Jesus would empty himself and come in the form of a babe and, and live like we live. Um, and go through things like we go through. And Father, we're so thankful to be able to celebrate and to focus in on that 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 wonderful and uh, life-giving fact uh, that He came and that You sent Him. And we're we are so thankful that we can gather today to celebrate that. Father, we also are so thankful that You give us the privilege of being able to to um, come to You and talk to You and bring the concerns of our hearts. So this morning, we ask You just to be with those that have been mentioned here today. I should be with those who are still fighting cancers and other diseases and um, they're going through these recoveries. And um, we've got some good news here today, Father, as well as um, we need to continue to remember, remember them, remember their own family as they go through this time of loss. And I know during this time of year it's hard um, um, to, to go through loss, and, and sometimes I'm thinking about the ones that we have lost. So if I would just pray for comfort for those here this morning, um, those who are in this auditorium and maybe not with us here today, but that you just intercede on each of their behalf. Father, we're so thankful that you give us the opportunity to gather in a place such as this to worship you. And Father, we just pray that you would, uh, um, you would be glorified, um, that you would be truly, um, um, the work that we have for you would be felt. And for all these things, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to
We're going to sing Near to the Cross for our communion hymn. It's on page 385 in your hymnal. Uh, we're going to sing the first and, and last. You know, first and last verse? Yes. Okay. First and last verse. And uh, just what? Okay. No, it's Whatever it says on the Whatever page it says. Mine says one and five. I don't have to do first. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. One, first and last. And then we're going to have a short devotion. We'll pray together. We're going to have a few moments of uh, quiet before we, we take communion together. And then uh, then we'll all take communion together. So if you haven't already gotten it, you can get up as we, um, as we sing this song together. Sing with me, Near the Cross, as we pray for communion. First and last. Sometimes during the Christmas season, Jesus can become the missing child. The days surrounding the holidays get so busy, that even for followers of Jesus. Add to that all the attempts to strip any Christian influences away from the public agenda. It isn't hard to imagine Jesus asking at times, Have you seen me? Whenever you see the picture of a missing child, you might be looking at that child from 10 to 15 years ago when he or she first went missing. Today, that child would look quite different. And with Jesus, our focus cannot be only on the baby in the manger. He looks much different now. He is the risen Lord and Christ, the King, who will one day return for his people. Christmas has always been about much more than a baby. Bethlehem was just the beginning of one grand Christmas package that, be that began to be opened with Jesus' birth. 
If we focus only on the baby, we'll miss the rest of the package. We have to move from the manger to the cross, mm -hmm. from Bethlehem to Calvary, even at and especially at this time of the year. There at the cross, the words <coughs> that the angel told Joseph concerning Mary's child from the Holy Spirit were fulfilled. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That's Matthew 1, 21. Communion at this time of the year provides a special reminder to us that when we look at all the usual ads, promotions, commercials, and sales, Jesus is still the most important gift. In fact, he is the real gift of Christmas, one to be treasured every day. Father, we, we thank you so much for this time that the, the privilege and the honor to be, be before your table this morning to partake of these emblems, uh, the, the bread which represents the body of Christ and, and the cup which represents his blood that was given for us and sacrificed for us, Father, that, that our sins could be covered and forgiven. Father, we thank you so much for this special gift of Jesus. We thank you, thank you for it, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we also gather as part of our worship at the spring of our tithes and offerings. Again, this morning is in the back of the auditorium. Um, those who are watching, maybe you did bring with you this morning. You also can give through our app, through our website. You can give through mailing it, do your own bank, or you can um, just bring it by here or mail it this week. So let's pray for our tithes and offerings as our act of worship as well. Most gracious Heavenly Father, um, thank you so much. This is the time of year where we start looking at our life. Um, looking at back to this year, last year as we look forward to the new year and we uh, a lot of times we reflect in, in these times and look at the way um, our life has been and probably help us more as we look back on our lives and, um, to reflect on uh, our relationship with you and our spiritual lives and um, how you have influenced us and how we have influenced others and Father just continue to bless us help us be good stewards of our time um, and the way we use the gift that you have given us and Father as we gather a time like this and when we give back a portion of the way you have blessed us financially, Father, we just pray that as we give today and throughout this week, uh, that we give um, in such a way um, that it's not begrudgingly, but we give it freely, and then Father, we, we give it back to you as good stewards of the things you've provided for us. So as we 
Give those gifts today. We ask you to bless those gifts, bless those who are able to give and who are not able to give this this day. But Father, we pray that it be used for the building up of your kingdom. We have all these things in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Children's church. Kids are dismissed. Go to children's church. That's fine.
What will happen when Joseph finds out that I'm pregnant and, and he knows that this child is not his child? What is my community going to say when they find out that I'm pregnant and I haven't even went to Joseph's house yet? Mary could have, could have expected divorce at best, death at the worst, and certainly a lot of questions and a lot of conflict. But Mary's simple answer to Gabriel in verse 38 was, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. <coughs> See, consider Mary, Mary's humble trust in God and his purposes for her life. What would it be like for, for you to entrust yourself to God, just like we see in Mary, especially as we consider our future that, that fills you with apprehension about what's going to happen tomorrow? Or as you consider the future of someone else you love. It's a scary thing to submit yourself to someone else, to another person. Even if our theology tells us that God is trustworthy and perfectly good. What in your life are you struggling right now to entrust to God? You'd rather call the shots in that relationship with, with your career path, with your investments, with your habit. Not sure what you're struggling with to entrust God to. But what fears or errors of your life do you find yourself today hiding or just not talking about with your friends or with your family? See, our pride runs deep. We would rather be in control because we still think, even after all our mistakes, that we know better than God. But God blesses those who entrust themselves to Him in humility. Elizabeth says of Mary, Luke 1 45, blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. God is pleased with those who humbly believe his word and entrust them themselves to him. God is looking for people who think that he alone can do great things for us. And in Mary's magnificent, in verses 46 through 55, she rejoices that God, that, uh, that God lifts up the humble and brings down the pride the proud. That is why Mary was chosen to carry the Christ child. It is the opportunity. It is, it is the, it was her opportunity, but it was absolutely the opposite of the way that the world thinks. The world works. We are enamored with beauty and talent and being celebrities. But as God says to Samuel, after another miraculous birth long ago, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And the heart he is looking for is a heart that, is, that humbly trusts him. See, this, this great reversal is what Christmas is all about. God doesn't only come and bless those who humbly trust him, and he comes in humility himself. Turn over to Luke chapter 2, and in verses 1 through 7, Mary gives birth to Jesus, just as Gabriel said she would. And Mary lays her firstborn son in an animal feeding trough. And we don't get many details. Was there a mean innkeeper that says, you can't stay here? How was the journey? How was the delivery? How did Mary and Joseph feel? What, was, the, was it a cave or was it a stable? Where, were there animals all around? Were there other people there with her? We don't know. Luke doesn't focus on all of those details because he wants us to see the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that God became a man. See, consider the humility of Christ, along with the, the uh, Apostle Paul, when he writes in uh, Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 6. Listen to what it says. It says, Who, although he existed in the form of God, of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in a, an appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, God could, God would come to us, his people, that he made as a servant, as a weak, dependent, little baby boy. And in the fullness of time, God would highly exalt his humble son 
who took the nature of a servant. And he promises to exalt all those who humble themselves like Mary and like his son. Can, can you imagine the joy to be exalted and glorified with the God of the universe himself? Only those who humbly trust God will ever know that favor. The promised Savior does not merely come to us in humility as a servant, but he comes according to God's promise to David. He came as Christ the King, the Messiah. And that's what we're going to consider next. David's promised Messiah. See, David's, David had everything a man could ever want. But like Eve, David wanted more. And David took what he wanted. He took another man's wife. He murdered that man so that he could keep her. David would not be the promised serpent crusher. But God loved David. And he made a promise to him that, that as he had made the promise to Adam and Eve in the midst of the curse, that is what God said to David, King David. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 7, turn verse 12. Listen to what it says. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Over a thousand years have passed since God's promise to David. And as we considered last week, many in Israel had just forgotten about that promise to, to the student, that they just started living their lives just the way they wanted to live their lives. There was no indication that God would ever keep his promise because there had been 400 years of silence. But then Gabriel shows up to the virgin named Mary and tells her that the Lord God will give her a son. And Luke 1, starting verse 32, the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Gabriel tells Mary that her child is the one who establishes David's throne forever. And when this child is born, the angels deliver the same message over in Luke chapter 2, starting verse 10, he says, But the angels said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and the, the, he is the Christ, the Lord. Christ means Messiah, the promised divinic king. And this is why it is significant that Joseph comes from the line of David and that the child is born in the city of David in Bethlehem. This child is a fulfillment of the promise of David. But other than seeing the trustworthiness of God to fulfill his ancient promises, why is the promise and the fulfillment so significant for us? We have to read on. See, eight days after the birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph traveled to the temple for the circumcision of their firstborn. And we see two individuals who encourage us to rejoice at God's salvation come in David's promised Messiah. It's found in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 25. And the Holy Spirit has told Simon, you won't die before seeing the Messiah, Luke 2, 26. And when Mary and Joseph show up with their newborn son, the Holy Spirit moves Simon to approach that family. And I wonder what Mary and Joseph must have been thinking when the strange man took their newborn child into his arms. And we know Mary and Joseph marveled at what Simon says about their baby. In verse 30, verse 30, it says, This child is salvation to all, for all people, Jew and Gentile. And then if Simon had not been enough to shock Mary and Joseph, Anna shows up. Mm -hmm. And she spreads the news to all that this, this child is the one who would really and truly redeem Israel. And if I were Joseph, I don't know what I would have done at that point. Quit telling everyone about my child. It's getting weird, right? But it isn't weird, right? The joy we see from the shepherds and from Simon and from Anna must be our joy today. See, God has sent the promised divinic ruler. Salvation is here in him. What the world has been waiting for has finally arrived. And the answer to your brokenness and the fulfillment of your greatest expectations in this life, it's here. But what we see at the conclusion of Simon's prophecy is that salvation should not, should, should not come how Israel had expected it to come. Simon takes Mary aside and says this cryptic thing to her in the midst of all the rejoicing. For this king would establish his throne in the in this most ironic way, a sword through his mother's soul. 
and this Messiah's death would reveal the state of all hearts. If you're not a Christian here today, I'm really glad you're here today if you're not. See, you're always welcome. And I wonder if your heart's motives, your loves, and, and everything about you was exposed. What kind of picture would it show? How would you feel about that? I'm sure this idea of being exposed and judged is one reason that you find it difficult to even come to church. And don't worry, we're not going to hold a confession and have everybody confess their sins here this morning. <laughs> but confession is part of that, right? See, if you're not a Christian, if you're unbelieving, we do want your heart to be exposed to yourself right now. You need salvation for yourself. And you have not lived a life that has pleased the holy God, and probably you know it today. Just as Simon and Anna understood that not all was right with the state of Israel that they were living inside of, God sent his Messiah because not all is right with the state of our hearts. Like Adam and Eve, we have not trusted God's word. We have rebelled against him. And like King David, we take our own desires, the way we want to do things, and we want to do it that way. And for our sin and our rebellion, God has sent his promised king to rescue us, to save us. But instead of winning the war against evil through political cunning or military strength, he laid down his life for us. A spear literally pierced his side as his mother watched his dead body hanging lifeless after hours of torture on a Roman cross. Was her little child whom she had laid in the manger, was this the promised Messiah? This was the one whom shepherds worshipped. This is what God's people had been waiting for from the very beginning of time. Surely not. And the king of the Jews suffered on the cross, not just the agony of a torturous death. Christ endured the wrath of his father for human sin. We, he brings salvation by bearing the punishment of all who would turn and humble themselves and turn towards him and trust that this is not just the son of David, but this is God's son who came to make all things new. We look for joy in many places. We do. And I hope you know by now the places you tend to look for joy. But today, I beg you to look to the man. The rugged cross, the empty tomb, the throne in heaven. And see your See, he's the only one who can save you from your sin. He is the only one who can make you whole. He is the only one who can bring you true, lasting joy. And for he is the source of all joy. All joy you know in this life come from him. He made all of it. He wired your emotion, your appetites. He gave you your family, your community, that in the brokenness and pain are meant to point to the joy that can only be found in Jesus. The happiness and pleasures are meant to point you to him again. And you can take up the child in your arms, and even now in faith, you can hear the words of love in God's words and know the nearness of him. The question is, will you? And the fact that the child was not only a humble servant, not only the very king, but he is the son of the most high God, is what we will consider third and finally, God's glorious son. As we consider... Well, as we considered earlier with Eve and King David, God had everything he could ever want. He had, a per he had perfect joy and fellowship with himself in the Trinity. He had existed from eternity past in perfect joy, yet he wanted more, and he gave. He gave life to Adam and Eve. He made promises to them and to Abraham and to David. And just at the right time, when no one was expecting and when the world wasn't taking much notice, he gave his beloved son. Gabriel had told Mary that her son would be great and he would be called the son of the most high and that the holy one to be born would be called the son of God. The angel had declared to the shepherds that this child was the Lord. Heaven had come to meet earth in great praise and joy and the angels worship glory to God in the highest. Are you astounded at the glorious humility? Is your heart brimming, brimming, brimming this morning with joy? If, if, you, if you're anything like me, your heart is unaffected by this most often. We sing the song so often. We go through Christmas year after year after year. And we're more interested in the new. And this is an old story. 
the developments of politics, the, the, the dopamine hit of our social media news feeds, of, of looking at what's happening right now, the newest Hollywood block blockbuster, the recent album that just dropped, the viral YouTube clip gets you going and sharing. You share that all the time. Just as the shepherds share their joy when the angels lift up their mobile devices uh, through the night sky. For many of us, the familiarity of the Christmas story has deadened the impact that it should have on our lives. We have lost our wonder. Dorothy Sayers agrees. She writes this. The tale of the time when God was the underdog and got beaten, when he submitted to the conditions he laid down and became a man like the men he had made, and the men he had broke him, and they killed him. This is the dogma we find so dull. This terrifying drama of which God is the victim and hero. If this is dull, what in heaven's name is, wor is worthy to be called exciting? Now we may call that doctrine exhilarating, or we may call it devastating, or we may call it revelation, or we may call it rubbish, but we can, we can call it dull, and then words have no meaning at all. And any journalist hearing it for the first time would recognize that it is news. Those who did it for the first time actually called it news. The good news at that, though we are likely to forget that the word gospel never meant anything so sensational. If the Christian message doesn't strike you as sensational, I encourage you to observe Mary's response to her son and our final text this morning. Look over with me in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he became twelve, they went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending a full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it. But supposed him to be in the caravan, and went a day's journey, and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know I'm, I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept him <coughs> in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. This boy understood that the Most High was his father. And he longed to be, be in his father's presence where the father's law was discussed, examined, and interpreted. Mary and Joseph were obviously exasperated like any parent who has ever lost a child would be. But Jesus was safe. He is where he belonged. God's glorious presence had left the temple in the time of Ezekiel. But here, as a 12-year-old little boy, God had returned to this temple. God's presence was among the people and in the most remarkable way. The teachers of the law were amazed at this little boy's understanding and question of the law. But imagine their amazement if they knew that this little boy was God the Son. Jesus returned home with his parents and subjected to, was, submits to their authority that he, as the Son of God, had given them. And Mary treasured all these things in her heart. And that is where Christmas leaves us. Us. Consider the responses to this entry of the Son of God into this world. See, Mary and her truck in her humble um, trust in God's word, Simon and Anna, as they were responded to God's salvation. And now Mary again, as she treasured in her heart that her little boy called the God of the universe his father. Have you taken a moment yet this Christmas season to treasure all these things in your heart? Have you pondered it? Meditated on it? You won't slide into meditating on it. It won't happen on accident. There are too many distractions. The enemy is way too active. 
How will you consider in your heart the message today? How will you even consider these things in the quietness of our own heart right now? The Incarnation is, as one author put it, the most breathtaking demonstration in history of God's love for His creation and His intention to make all things new. You and I have everything we could ever want. For if this God loves us with such a deep love that He would send His Son who would take on the nature of a servant, who would suffer for our salvation, and that would raise up with Him, making all things new, we, we are those who have everything. For we have God Himself. And yet, we want more, don't we? More of Him. We want to see as the angels see God's glory. We want to know His favor so that we might live confident lives of praise, knowing the peace that God has secured for us through His life, death, and resurrection. We want to be full of joy like the shepherds and tell everyone we know of all that we have heard and all that we have seen because our God reigns. And if you have known, have never known that joy of Mary and Elizabeth, the shepherds, and the angel, and Simon, and Anna, and this child. Pray. Pray that God will give you eyes to see what child is this. And ask him that we would give you, he would give you unspeakable joy. The joy that comes through knowing the source of all joy, and love himself, knowing Christ, the newborn king. See, we live on a visited planet. One where God himself was born. Walked among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only full of grace and truth. What God has done is so astounding. Will you marvel? Will you rejoice? Will you worship? Let's pray. Let's pray to the Father. What a remarkable thing you have done for us. You would empty yourself. And you would come and live this life of his humble servant and die for us. Father, this morning, there are some here that need to make changes to our lives. Maybe the things that we've been doing is not the things we should be doing. Maybe there's some things that we just need different. Maybe there's some here that just need to accept you as your Lord, you as Lord and Savior today. Father, we pray as we sin that those decisions will be made. For all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last night I was looking uh, looking for some songs. And I came across a couple. Little Drum Boy has always been a great song. I love it. And at first I came across for King and Country and their rendition of that song. And it is beautiful and it's powerful. And then I came across Carrie Underwood and her little boy. And they sang that song together. And he doesn't have a great voice. He has a good voice, but he's not a great voice. And it was the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. Listening to that little boy sing those words. And that song talks about giving ourselves, surrendering ourselves. I have nothing else to give but myself. And that's the decision you have to make here this morning. Maybe there's some of you need to make changes in your life. Is your life on the altar before God? Have you given your all? Maybe there's some part of us that we have not surrendered. We have been hanging on to. Maybe today is the day to get rid of that. As we enter into the new year next week, maybe there's some changes you need to make. Whatever those changes are, we're going to sing I Surrender All here this morning. Tell them the number. If you open your hymnals, it's on page 366. Will you stand with me? In the young decision to make, come as we sing.
Christmas and have a great uh, day. There will be no evening services here. And so uh, we'll dismiss. We're going to um, conclude with uh, Go Tell on the Mountain. Uh, you'll see it at 138 in your, in your hymnal if you need it. Um, let, let's pray. Let's pray, Stanley Father. Thank you so much for this day. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give us to worship you. And finally, as we dismiss from here and we go out in, into um, time with our families and friends and as we continue to celebrate this Christmas day, that you would just be with each of us and bring us back to the next appointed hour. We pray all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>